So good evening, everybody. Um, today we are going to discuss about how to approach a cyanotic heart disease in a newborn. So if you're finding a child who is cyanotic uh, after resuscitation or uh, in a newborn, your outreach, outreach clinic, then how we are going to approach this babies is what the Nitin has given me the topic to discuss. So let's go ahead with the topic. So basically, cyanosis is very much normal in the first 10 minutes of newborn because all of you know because of the adjustment of fetal circulation. So what happens if it persists beyond 10 to 15 minutes, then we have to seriously consider that what's happening with the baby. So cyanosis is newborn means there is a bluish discoloration of either of lips or mucosa, nails or skin. In a very fair child, even the skin can be appeared as blue. So what happens if there is a deoxygenated hemoglobin or reduced hemoglobin, which is more than five grams, then we can see the cyanosis. But obviously these adjustments are different in newborn because of the persistent fetal uh, hemoglobin. And a little bit, it is different in the adults or once the transition happens to the adult hemoglobin. So we all know that the cyanosis is predominantly divided into central cyanosis and peripheral cyanosis. And we all know maybe how to differentiate them. And I'm not going to enter that area because then it may take a lot of our time. But I just want to highlight that the newborn has got more fetal hemoglobin and thus a serious reduction in the oxygenation should happen. There should be a lot of reduced hemoglobin, deoxygenated hemoglobin. Less than 40 millimeters of mercury should be the oxygen, uh, uh, should be the PO2s before appearing the clinical cyanosis. So if there is a child, you may appear the desaturation just uh, less than 90%, but in newborn, it can reach as good as less than 75% and less than 80% before apparently having the obvious cyanosis because of the nature of fetal hemoglobin, which has got more affinity towards the oxygen. So we should remember this. Uh, the NNF has come out with the pulse oximeter screen testing to rule out serious congenital heart disease uh, at the newborn in outreach clinic. So what happens if you are seeing a newborn uh, within first 24 hours or after that, then not necessarily the, all the heart diseases can present immediately after birth because there can be presence of ductus arteriosus, a wide foramen oven, and because of all those things, somehow the, the circulation is still maintained. And as I said, that cyanosis may not be apparent in newborn, although the saturations are close to 90%. And there may not be any murmur. So in all the circumstances, it is very difficult to determine whether the newborn is having serious heart disease or not. And sometimes it can be of medical legal importance that you said that my baby is fine, we were discharged home and the baby comes back with the severe heart disease or severe distress shock like presentation. So to avoid that, there is this pulse oximeter screening text testing, which is quite good. So in this, what happens is we need to do the saturations in the right upper limb and the lower limb that suggests preductal and postductal. And if the saturations are more than 95%, the, dis, uh, the difference of upper limb and lower limb, that is right upper limb and right lower limb is lesser than 3%, then it almost, um, the critical congenital heart disease, we can safely, um, we can, can be ruled out. But if there is a pre-ductal oxygen difference, which is more than 3% and saturations are less than 90%, or saturations are ranging between 90 to 95%, then it should be checked again at least three times uh, with one hour interval duration. And if any of this value comes significant, like less than, it is ranging from less than 95% and difference is more than 3% upper limb to lower limb, then these babies should be sent for 2D echocardiogram. So this probably is very hands-on and I'm sure that a lot of our pediatrician friends are following this. Now, how do we approach? Uh, there can be cyanosis because of uh, congenital heart disease or there can be cyanosis because of respiratory distress, because of the lung pathology. There can be cyanosis due to central. 
So we all know that how to differentiate it. There can be respiratory distress. There is uh, this oxygen testing is there. Give 100% FiO2 and then which also helps in differentiating PPHN and heart diseases. So there are this, this there are these testings available. So once you label that you are, there is no lung problem, there is no neurological problem, there is no airway problem, and you suspect that there is a heart disease in a child. So then how do we approach these children is probably I'm going to discuss more today. So if there is a cyanosis and there is no murmur to the child, with mild tachypnea may or may not present. So then uh, the most important differential diagnosis starts on the transposition of great arteries. Because in normal human being, the circulation is in the series. That means the deoxygenated blood goes into the lungs. Then oxygenated blood comes back into the pulmonary, from the pulmonary circulation into the left atrium and it is circulated into the aorta. But in deep transposition of great arteries, what happens? that the deoxygenated blood is coming from the systemic veins into the right atrium, right ventricle, again goes into the aorta. And the oxygenated blood is going into the pulmonary arteries. So they are in parallel circulation. And usually there is no murmur because hardly there is a shunt. There is a foramen ovale and ductus arteriosus, which are essential part of PGA babies, but it doesn't give rise to any murmur. And that's why the cyanosis without murmur, most common diagnosis in heart disease will be the transposition of great arteries. Then second differential is VSD pulmonary atresia. A child who was apparently all right at the first 48 hours of life. And then when naturally the ducts gets restricted, the pulmonary blood flow doesn't happen. And they become more and more cyanosed. And immediately they come back to a pediatrician saying that the child is very blue, not breathing, or almost in gastric situation because of the closing PDM. Similarly, the pulmonary atresia and dark septum. So there can be VST, there may not be VST, but once it is a pulmonary atresia, it is a duct-dependent pulmonary circulation. Once the duct starts closing, they become very cyanosed. Similarly, there can be pulmonary atresia along with complex heart disease, like single ventricle or tricuspid atresia or AV canal defect. But essentially the flow is, the pulmonary flow depends on the ductus arteriosus. So all these patients, they present within three four, to four days of life as soon as the duct starts getting closed. They may, they, may not, they may be normal just immediately after birth because there might be a large ductus arteriosus, but soon the ducts, once it starts closing, they become very sinus. If there is a saturation difference, so I want to talk about coarctation of aorta a little bit more. So what happens if there is a saturation difference, but no blood pressure difference? So if there is a um, large ductus arteriosus in coarctation of aorta, so ductus is supplying the descending aorta. So that's why the blood pressure difference may not be there. There is a large PDA which is giving ductus arterial, which is giving blood supply to lower left. So you may not have blood pressure difference, but you may have saturation difference because upper limb is supplied by left ventricle, the lower limb is supplied by right ventricle. So you will definitely have the saturation difference, which suggests that there is a coarctation of aorta. In presence of again large PDA, there may not be any sign of, there may not be any blood pressure difference. Now, if there is a heart failure and murmur, so this again can be divided heart failure at birth. So suppose there is a child who is just delivered and there is a very hyperdynamic precordium, huge cardiomegaly, uh, and there is a hepatomegaly. So again, these lesions are not dependent on any shunt. So it can be due to severe MR or severe TR, or there is any extra cardiac shunt which is happening like vein of gallon malformation, hepatic avia which can lead to the which can lead to the uh, problems like uh, heart failure but if you are finding heart failure symptoms after 2 to 3 weeks of life then they are shunt dependent that means soon the pulmonary vascular resistance is dropping and then the vsd or at the ductal level the shunt happens and because of that, they start having the heart failure symptoms. So classical examples with truncus arteriosus, TGA VSD, single ventricle VSD, tricuspid atresia VSD. Again, TAPVR, 
falls in first category and falls in second category also in first category if it is severely obstructed tapvr the symptoms will be there at birth itself soon after the birth as soon as the pulmonary flow increases by natural breathing they will have severe breathing difficulty and cyanosis so that is first and second is once uh, if they are unobstructed then they can present little bit later on also like one to two months of age or later uh, in um, after 15 to 20 days of life then there is a fourth category that is the cyanosis with shock so typically this this is an example of duct dependent systemic circulation that means uh, the systemic circulation is is dependent on ductus arteriosus. So classical example is hypoplastic left heart syndrome, where the pulmonary artery and the duct, and then uh, the systemic circulation, the blood is getting diverted. Or the, another example is severe uh, aortic stenosis, critical aortic stenosis, or rarely it can be TAPVR also. As I said that, uh, the severely obstructed TAPVR can have shock and severe cyanosis as a presentation, which will be there soon after the birth. So as we were talking, basically the cyanosis in congenital heart disease is duct dependent or duct independent. That means there is no duration of, uh, if the duct is constricted, then they are becoming sick. That relationship is not there with the heart disease. So what is uh, duct dependent circulation. Uh, just hold on, this internet connection is getting unstable. I'll connect it. Just hold on, please. Audible. And so, duct dependent, some of the heart diseases, which are so where the duct is supplying the systemic circulation, is called as duct dependent systemic circulation. Example is co optation of aorta, critical aortic stenosis, and HLHS. And presentation is they have cyanosis and they have shock because when the duct is getting small, there is no blood into the systemic circulation. So blood pressure drops, saturation drops, and also the urine output drops. Now there is duct dependent systemic circulation. In this situation, it's a pulmonary atresia, any kind of pulmonary atresia, VST pulmonary atresia, intact septum pulmonary atresia, or single ventricle atresia. And along with that, TGA, because TGA for mixing of the blood, the uh, ductus arteriosus is very important in transposition of great artery. So they will present with cyanosis and tachypnea, but they will not have shock because entire cardiac output is going only into the aorta. So blood pressure is maintained. So in first category, you have to monitor urine output and blood pressure. In second category, we have to monitor saturations. So some of the duct independent uh, uh, congenital cyanotic heart diseases are like TAPVCs, TGA, VST, single ventricle VST, transport atresia, VST, truncus arteriosus. So all these patients, they present little bit later on, like two to four weeks of life, when the pulmonary vascular resistance drops. And TAPVC it present when, if it is obstructed soon after the birth, if it is unobstructed, then it can present little bit later on also with cyanosis, tachypnea, failure to thrive, all the symptoms. Sometimes there can be just peripheral fistulas, AV fistulas, and because of that, there can be severe pulmonary artery hypertension, foramen over right to left shunting, which can create the cyanosis. And again, they can present soon after the birth because since during fetal life, there is being AV fistula and volume overload condition. And because of that, they present with pulmonary artery hypertension and heart failure symptoms. So after clinical, we will go to the uh, bedside investigation. So some of the bedside investigations are ECG and X-ray. So the most common investigation is X-ray. It is very helpful because it will rule out if there is any lung parenchymal abnormality. So as you can see here, this is the X-ray of a child who is having oligemic lung feeds. Again, he's cyanotic, so that's our 80 percent, 75 to 80 percent. So you can observe that the lung fields are oligemic. There is RV apex and pulmonary artery concavity is deep. So this is the X-ray of VSD pulmonary atresia patient. So because it is dependent on ductus arteriosus, the flow is less in the ductus. That's why the lung fields are polygamic and there is a RV apex. 
Now let's see the next X-ray. Again, this is a very sick child. You can see it is intubated. Bilateral total whiteout. You can see bronchial markings, which are very prominent. So this is a condition where there is a severe pulmonary venous congestion and child is intubated. Cardiothoracic ratio apparently is normal. So this is almost diagnostic of obstructed uh, TAPVC. And this baby will need urgent surgery the day it is diagnosed. Better to do surgery on same day or following day because of severe pulmonary venous congestion. They will be very sick child. They will be in shock. Saturations will be low. And whatever increment of FiO2 you do, but still the oxygen level doesn't become better here. Now, this is the, again, in uh, 15 to 20 days old child, there is a cardiomegaly and increased vascularity. You can see here the vascularity is increased, but it is not like previously where there is a pulmonary venous congestion. You can see here, this is a typical of pulmonary venous congestion. There is a syphilization and um, totally it's like white out lung fields and because of that, so prominent airways are seen here. But here, the pulmonary arteries are dilated. And this is a condition of truncus arteriosus. Because why I'm saying truncus? Because the pulmonary arteries are not in normal location. As we can see, RPA should come down from the right hilum. So here, there is a high takeoff of pulmonary arteries. Your pulmonary artery arises from ascending order. And since there is no normal continuity between right ventricle and the pulmonary artery, there is no main pulmonary artery. The uh, right and left pulmonary artery are typically origin from, uh, from the upper part that, that there is ascending order from there it arises. And that's why it is called as high takeoff of PA. So here you will typically find the abnormal location of pulmonary artery with cardiomegaly with increased vascularity because the aorta is high pressure and it is giving more and more flow into the pulmonary artery. And there is a VSD as well, large VSD. So that's why they present with high output failure and they will have heart failure symptoms. Now look at this x-ray. You can see here there is a cardiomegaly and vascularity is increased. But in this x-ray, there is a cardiomegaly, but vascularity is reduced. So this is a typical x-ray of a newborn with Epstein's anomaly. So in Epstein's anomaly, there is a severe tricuspid regurgitation. Because of that, the right atrium gets dilated and we can see the huge heart. And because the fetal vascular resistance is high, that small RV cannot pump blood into the pulmonary circulation. And because of that, the lung fields remains oligemic. So most of the blood from right ventricle goes back into the right atrium here. So no blood is going into the pulmonary arteries. And that's why the lung fields are oligemic here. Now, this is a typical x-ray of TGA. All of you are familiar with. So what happens in TGA? It's an egg on side appearance, first of all, and narrow vascular pedicle. So normally, the aorta is on the right side and it's posterior. Pulmonary artery is on the left side and it is anterior. So they cross each other like that. So because of that, we can see a wide superior mediastinum here. But in transposition of great arteries, they are just one above the each other. So that's why the mediastinum is narrow. So that's why it is called as narrow vascular pedicle. The vascular pedicle is the part of superior mediastinum and it is seamed narrow on the chest x-ray. And that's why it is like the egg on kind of appearance. You will also find the prominent vascularity because of the flow going into the pulmonary artery in, from the ductus arteriosus. Now this is an x-ray where Child will be very sick, is intubated, we can see here. But lung parenchyma is normal. There is nothing remarkable on the heart also. In fact, the CTR is of normal size. So again, this is one of the picture of PPHN where uh, of any lung insult or either birth asphyxia, meconium aspiration syndrome, they can have right to left shunting across the duct and that's why they, are, they desaturate. So here, typically, the cardiothoracic ratio is normal. Again, the X-ray of HLHS baby would be normal. Coarctation, sometimes it is normal. Sometimes if there is a huge cardiomegaly ventricular dysfunction, you, you may see a cardiomegaly also on X-ray. Now, let's look at the clues from the ECG. Now, this is uh, some 
again, I, I know that not all of you would be taking ECGs, but it really gives clues in certain heart diseases, uh, cyanotic heart diseases. So BSD pulmonary atresia, you will not have any major clue from the ECG. There will be right axis deviation and the right ventricular hypertrophy. You can see that the R wave is very tall here and uh, there is a right axis deviation. But what you can find is early transition from V1 to V2. That means the, there is a tall R wave in V1 and suddenly in V2 you will find the deep S wave also. So this is called as la transi early transition from V1 to V2. It happens in VSD pulmonary atresia or TOF patients. So that is the only clue you may find in certain patients. Otherwise, there will be right axis deviation and right ventricular hypertrophy, just like any other newborn. Now, this is a ECG of a newborn. You can see here, it's a tricuspid atresia. So this is very, very remarkable finding will be there in the ECG of tricuspid atresia baby. So normal newborn will have right ventricular hypertrophy. So right axis deviation will be there and tall R wave in V1 which suggests right ventricular dominance. But in tricuspid atresia, the RV is hypoplastic. So LV is dominant. So you will not find the right ventricular dominance at all. So there is a left axis deviation and there is no R in V1. You can see here. And there is a significant R in V6. So this suggests there is a severe RV hypoplasia. So if you show this ECG to me and say it is of newborn, then serious abnormality is there in the heart. That means because RV forces are not at all there, that means the RV is hypoplastic. So in tricuspid atresia, again, the ECG is very, very classical. This is a DILV patient. Again, this is one of the single ventricle double inlet left ventricle where LV is dominant and RV is hypoplastic. So again, you're finding that there is more of left axis deviation and no significant RV forces. And you can see all the QRS morphologies are looking same from V1 to V6. Again, this is very classical of single ventricle. So from V1 to V6, all QRS morphologies are same. So this suggests that there is a single ventricle kind of physiology happening. Now, this is a truncus arteriosus. Again, there will be uh, subtle clues might be there. So there is going to be right axis deviation and right ventricular forces are very dominant because RV is also a dominant ventricle in truncus arteriosus. RV is not small, but what you find is there will be very, uh, this is called as catch virtual phenomena, which is also seen in large VSDs. So that suggests that the increased volume overload in the right ventricle, left ventricle, they both are dominant. So you can see that such a tall R wave and deep S wave continuously from V1 to V6 is there. That means the both are under pressure overloaded and volume overloaded ventricles. And this is typical, again, uh, this is not very typical, but any large VSD or truncus arteriosus, you may find this kind of ECG. So let's uh, move forward to the uh, some of the cases. So I was talking about uh, the PPHN. So this is a very large PDA you're finding here, very large PDA, totally right to left shunt. So you must rule out coarctation of aorta before labeling any patient as uh, PPHN because sometimes in coarctation of aorta there might be very small isthmus and the duct is supplying descending aorta. That's why there is no feature of shock and upper limb, lower limb blood pressure difference. So we must rule out uh, um, coarctation of aorta and isthmus flow before labeling any patient as PPHN and before starting any medicine for this. So suppose you give inhaled nitric oxide or sildenafil and the patient is a coarctation, then they will have very bad outcome because there will be serious uh, mismatch of the blood pulmonary circulation and uh, they behave very poorly. And we should not try to close also these ducts because again, the lower limb is perfused because of the arteriosis. So please try to rule out coarctation of aorta before labeling any patient as PPHN. Now, this patient, we have done fetal echo and there was a um, large VST and there was no pulmonary artery and duct was supplying 
the pulmonary circulation. So same was confirmed. There is a large VSD here and there is no pulmonary artery seen. So it is a VSD pulmonary atresia. Again, this is an emergency because once the duct is closed, the child is going to die. So these patients will have cyanosis and it should be picked up on time. Um, so we have options of PDA standing like you can see here. This is the ductus arteriosus, which is supplying the pulmonary artery. And we usually stent it as an initial palliation. And after stenting around six months of age, they will be uh, sent for another surgery. Now, this is a child who had, we were discussing about coagulation of water. So there was a severe dysfunction to this child. And the duct was supplying bidirectionally. And there was a severe co-optation of water. We can see that this is the arch. There is a crowding of neck vessel. And here there is a narrowing and duct is supplying to the descending water. So again, this patient should be identified on time and should be operated because closing the duct or giving pulmonary vasodilator therapy can be contraindicated in this patient. Now let's look at the next child. He's a 20 days old baby. And we can observe that there is a, a slight cardiomegaly. The vascular pedicle is narrow. And look at the ABG. The pH is 6.7, severe acidosis. The PO2 is 61. That means there must be a cyanosis. And he is on ventilator. And PO, PCO2 is 31. <coughs> and you can see that the lungs are apparently normal. So this patient had transposition of great arteries. The foramen was closing, the duct was closing, there was no shunt happening. And eventually, before any procedure could be done on this patient, the patient succumbed. So it is very important to identify these kind of situation timely so that the treatment can be offered to them. And just a septostomy, that means a creation of wide foramen oval and prostaglandin could have saved this child. But it should, uh, such a bad bad pH and so much of acidosis, it's really a, a very bad outcome for congenital heart diseases. Now, this patient, as I was obviously the echocardiogram will show that there are two vessels they are transposed. So all of them are coming from right ventricle and the pulmonary artery is coming from left ventricle. Now, this is another child where uh, the doctor suspected that there is a pneumothorax on the left side. Uh, and you can see that the chest tube is inserted on the left side. The heart shadow is on the right side. And then there is an ET tube also in the place. So this is a day one baby had severe respiratory distress, kept on ventilator and thought of pneumothorax. So chest tube was inserted, but there was no improvement. Then the echocardiogram was done and it showed that there is a schemata syndrome. So this red flow, what you are observing is actually the pulmonary vein into the IVC. So schemata syndrome is associated with dextrocardia. There is association of right lung hypoplasia and that's why the left lung will be hyperinflate, hyperinflated, which should not be mistaken as pneumothorax. So... Uh, obviously, the plan of management and treatment is totally different in this. They may have severe pulmonary artery hypertension soon after the birth because of the obstruction at the pulmonary veins and hypoplasia of the right lung. So depending on the right lung volume and development of right lung, if it is severely hypoplastic, they may consistently have severe pH and may remain cyanotic. So the plan of treatment is totally different in this patient. Now, this is the next patient who is very stable, three days old baby, and came to pediatrician. Actually, there was nothing important, remarkable, except the saturations were 80%. And there was very faint uh, satur uh, murmur, that is two by six. Very glad that the pediatrician has picked it. You can see the four chamber room is normal. The four chamber room is normal. But there was a small PDA which was reported outside as a closing PDA because the pediatrician had had a doubt that why child is desaturating with 80% was sent for evaluation. 
So just want to highlight if any patient, any baby who is having closing PDA, but low saturation is a critical heart disease. That means the uh, systemic circulation or the pulmonary circulation is duct dependent. And because the duct is getting restricted, there is a desaturation which is happening. So we should not be send them home that, you know, you don't have anything, you're hemodynamically stable. Now just look at this child, what happened? There was a critical pulmonary artery stenosis, uh, valve stenosis, which was impending pulmonary atresia and duct was actually supplying the pulmonary arteries. And since now the baby was three days old and duct was so small, you can see here the duct was so small. So that's why he was desaturating. The next step is baby would become severe cyanosis, gasping and arrest. So any closing PDA, but child is desaturating is not a normal closing PDA, should be evaluated for serious congenital heart diseases like duct dependent circulations. Again, if there is a closing PDA is the report or you find out on your screening echo that the duct is closing, but child is in the shock. Again, it's a critical heart disease and it's a duct dependent systemic circulation and should not um, be just labeled at, okay, nothing is there, it's just closing PDA and treat as differently or treat as sepsis. So all this patient actually get benefited from the prostaglandin. Now, uh, this TGA baby we have discussed, as I said that TGA sometimes, if severely acidotic before reaching treatment itself, uh, they can succumb. So again, this is one of the child who had TGA. You can see that there is a cyanosis and there is a, uh, uh, there is a uh, ductus arteriosus which is supplying the pulmonary artery. There is a foramen oval. So in this circulation, how the ductus arteriosus is important, I want to highlight that. So I was talking to all of you that pulmonary venous return, which is coming to left atrium, goes to left ventricle. Left atrium, left ventricle. It goes to directly to pulmonary artery. So actually there is no blood which needs to be oxygenated here because all the oxygenated blood is coming into the pulmonary arteries again. So which blood will get oxygenated? Nothing will be oxygenated. So that's why the ductus arteriosus is very important here because the oxygenated blood which is going into the aorta will through ductus enter into the pulmonary artery. And this deoxygenated blood, whatever amount uh, is the effective pulmonary blood flow and that will have oxygenation which will come back into the left atrium and through foramen oval that will be shunted into the right ventricle and then it will go into the aorta. So the amount of blood which is going into the pulmonary artery through ductus arteriosus is the only amount of little blood which will undergo oxygenation and that's why they are highly, the oxygen levels highly dependent on foramen oval and ductus arteriosus. If foramen is getting small or if ductus arteriosus is getting restricted, then again, this TGA babies will become severely cyanosed and they may have death because of uh, improper shunting, which is happening this too. So prostaglandin plays a vital role and can be started on timely. And sometimes, if baby cannot be transported to surgery immediately, then septostomy can be done, which is a bedside simple procedure and the mixing can be improved. So that's what I have highlighted here. The ASD improves the systemic flow and the PDA improves the effective pulmonary blood flow. So the treatment eventually is the arterial switch surgery. So you disconnect aorta here, disconnect pulmonary artery here and connect them at the normal location. And if it is timely done, it's a life-saving procedure and they will have just like us, the normal life. The only thing is to identify them on the time. So as you can see here, this is the right ventricle, which is giving rise to aorta in a uh, transposition of great artery and pulmonary artery is coming from left ventricle. So this baby got operated at day three of life electively and surgery was done, discharged and did very well after the procedure. So one baby where 
if it is not timely identified can succumb before getting the adequate care and other child if it is identified on time can go ahead for surgery and can have the normal life so this is the next child which had severe respiratory distress cyanosis breathing difficulty and now look at the parameters here the abg was done he was intubated and post intubation i want to show this is the abg pco2 of 92 and po2 of 55 so you can see that there is a significant co2 retention and there is a significant respiratory uh, there is a significant respiratory acidosis and po2 is slightly reduced so this child is having airway issue because of the vascular ring so again echocardiogram was done which we suspected as double aortic arch we can find that this is the left arch and this is the right arch and you can see in this picture that it is encircling the trachea from 360 degree and there is a severe compression on the uh, trachea and that's why there was so much of co2 retention again any symptomatic child with vascular ring and if it is not identified on the time can succumb to death so we may be go on treating this patients with the respiratory failure but actually what they need is the ligation of this vascular ring and immediately they improve and which is not even a open heart surgery or simple thoracotomy surgery from the back can save their life and why uh, this had co2 retention even after intubation is because your normal size et tube won't pass through the severely obstructed trachea so actually the um, the et tube would hang somewhere above the obstruction so still there will be significant co2 retention and they may have variety of presentations like distress strider respiratory tract infections because of again and again reflux so again this uh, entity needs high uh, degree of suspicion and they may present with uh, recurrent pneumonia persistent pneumonia failure to thrive and they may have all kind of presentations but only high degree of suspicion is needed and if you find any child who is having co2 retention so always uh, anticipate the airway anomaly which can be due to the extrinsic vascular compression so again the surgery was done and you can find that there are two arches here this is one arch and this is another arch and you can find here that one of the arch is ligated here and now the trachea and esophagus are free of those vascular ring and baby would breathe normally and can be successfully extubated as i was talking about the ab fistula this is the child who is 15 days old severe pah had severe pah and was treated for pph in actually and you can find that x ray there is a cardiomegaly and always thought of heart failure symptoms due to severe ph that there is rv dysfunction there is severe tr and foramen shunts right to left that's why they will have cyanosis also but actually look at so much of hepatic avm which is present so again pphn is a diagnosis of exclusion we need to rule out if there is any secondary factor because of it the duct is shunting right to left foramen is shunting right to left so in this patient there was a huge hepatic avm and there was a so increased systemic venous return and because of that increased flow to the pulmonary circulation which lead to the high pulmonary artery hypertension and right ventricular failure and that's why the foramen was shunting right to left and had heart failure and cyanotic symptoms so again closure of these avms can help them and they can come out of this uh, ventilation and the supportive drug therapy again sildenafil and all those medicines i know have no role in this situation and should be targeted to close this now this x ray we told that there is a infra diaphragmatic tapvr so we had one of this patient uh, underwent ct scan because of very complex anatomy and you can see that this is a descending vertical vein which is uh, and all the four veins these are the all four veins which are joining at one point and then there is a descending vertical vein which is joining into the hepatic avm hepatic vein so usually hepatic vasculature gives lot of resistance sometimes they join portal vein they join 
um, ductus venosus or it the vein itself can be stenosed and obstructed and because of that soon after the birth as soon as the pulmonary blood flow increases they, they develop with this white out phenomena which will not respond to your ventilation not responding to surfactant or antibiotics so any white out lung should be suspected obstructed tapvr now this is one of the patient uh, this is a truncus arteriosus this we have discussed again they will have um, the heart failure symptoms and saturation will be around 85 to 90s and they will have mild stenosis but they will have more of heart failure symptoms because more blood is entering into the pulmonary circulation and it typically starts around 2 to 3 weeks of age so uh, again the x ray would show cardiomegaly increased vascularity and all those things similarly tga vsd or single ventricle vsd they all present in little bit later than 2 to 3 weeks of life so in conclusion saturation pre discharge helps in suspecting serious congenital heart diseases so do thorough clinical examination sometimes bedside testing gives the clue like ecg and x ray like we have seen here again if you are finding on your screening echo that foramen is right to left chin suspect of tabc don't think it is a uh, just a pbhn duct right to left chin again think of coarctation critical aortic stenosis and all serious congenital heart diseases should be suspected and they should not be just treated as pphn then closing pda but the child is very sick so again we need to suspect that there is a there can be a serious congenital heart disease can be underlying so thank you all and if there are any question thank I you ma'am for the visible question i have a few doubts on uh, and i will be asking them on my behalf for the questions which have been asked to me so the question one of the doctor is asking is uh, uh, how do we decide fluid in case a child is uh, of a cyanotic heart disease and he or she comes on first day of illness how much fluid should we choose your voice is not clear so the question is if there is a if there is a cyanotic heart disease how should we choose the fluid the start the fluid to be given to the newborn how much fluid yeah. and yeah. any medications which we can choose like pg and yeah. anoxia <clears throat> yeah so in a cyanotic heart disease if x ray is fine there is no cardiomegaly we should not restrict the fluid like if there is a vsd uh, pulmonary atresia is a condition or intact ivs is a condition we should give them normal maintenance fluids and it should not be restricted but suppose it is a ta pvr the lungs are white out there is a truncus arteriosus child is presented with heart failure there is a tga vsd baby is in heart failure then it should be restricted the fluid should be restricted and 70 to 80% should be given and i want to highlight that we we routinely give potassium free fluid to them um, not like uh, in uh, when they present to us we prefer to give potassium free fluid the reason is because of lactic acidosis or because of the diuresis which is given to the patient sometimes the renals are getting affected or like if there is a coarctation there can be a renal failure so they may have high potassium so we try to start with potassium free fluid it can be half dns or dextrose 10% depending on the age of the patient and once we see electrolyte then we take call of potassium to be added or not second question is from a doctor who, who is in tier 3 city and he mentioned that occasionally when he has referred newborn with the query congenital heart disease he was not sure what to start him with or how to how to shift a sick new cyanotic newborn any specific recommendations or any specific instruction for such doctors who have to refer such patients to tier 1 cities for proper care and management so that they can help their children in a better way any specific recommendations ma'am so uh, actually um, cyanotic heart diseases i am talk talking actually today so in a cyanotic heart diseases patient should be referred on prostaglandin it should be started around 20 to 40 nanograms per kg and 
we routinely give caffeine i in my unit i routinely start them on caffeine because then uh, they will not have prostaglandin induced apnea or if you are intubating and sending the patient then keep fio2 to the lower side keep it 20 21% don't keep 80% 100% and uh, while we are resuscitating this patient in newborn after the delivery because we routinely have antenatal uh, scans also where we diagnose it's a vsd pulmonary atresia or it is coarctation or it is tga so in resuscitation we clearly tell pediatrician that don't give oxygen while resuscitating as far as possible so oxygen may trigger uh, duct to close so we avoid them not to give oxygen and as you correctly mentioned transporting this patients is challenging we should give uh, prostaglandin in cyanotic heart diseases if they are duct dependent and in tga babies also and correct their uh, lack acidosis and uh, electrolytes before shifting ma'am what are the recommendation for uh, uh, for a pregnant female uh, if if we diagnose congenital heart disease in uh, during pregnancy uh, are there any specific recommendation for some conditions where child need the determination of pregnancy is indicated uh if if the, if the mother is diagnosed with i mean if the fetus is diagnosed with cyanotic heart disease or any heart disease in in general in heart diseases it is uh, not all the heart diseases we need to de deliver close to cardiac center that is not it i'll give some examples like if there is a vst or if there is a tetralogy of fallots or if there is a mild form of epstein's anomaly if there is a ctga so all this uh, babies we clearly tell them that you please deliver at your own center and get the baby once uh, they are settled and once it is discharged for complete evaluation but there are certain diseases which needs to be delivered close to cardiac center if not in cardiac center so there are example is tga tga baby please don't deliver if you know the fetus is having tga we should not deliver in the village or in a town then transfer them 200 kilometers to the cardiac unit it should not be done because any time if the duct gets close acidosis builds up and then we send for surgery the risk is very high for mortality if there is an underlying comorbidity so better to deliver them close to cardiac unit if it's a transposition if it is a uh pulmonary atresia condition again can be delivered at a obstetric unit but in the same city preferably so that it can be easily transferred and third is in coarctation critical aortic stenosis critical pulmonary stenosis any baby who is with high drops known heart disease like if there is a complete heart block and baby is in high drops so we need tpi temporary pacemaker there is a tachyarrhythmia going on babies in high drops again we need treatment for the arrhythmias so all these lesions we should uh, you know deliver close to heart unit only okay thank you ma'am uh, there is uh, there is no other in fact some i many... got a question yeah but very uh, my question is about the 3d construction picture had shown us is it ct angio reconstructed images so we requested can most radiologists report it yes so it is a 3d construction ct scan picture actually i am very very fond of vascular rings and uh, uh, fetal vascular rings also our publication is already to come in the annals of pediatric cardiology so uh, in all vascular rings It is very mandatory to get it done CT scan picture because you will have three-dimensional orientation that where trachea is getting compressed, where esophagus is getting compressed. Is there any other anomaly associated, and where exactly the surgery should be done? Like which area is hypoplastic? Suppose there is a vas double aortic arch, we have to make sure that which arch is smaller, that arch would be ligated. so for all these minor details the ct scan is very very useful and we do ct scan in all the vascular rings but suspicion is always echocardiogram 
and we have a lot of uh, good hands-on and experience in echocardiography with vascular rings. So uh, it really helps. The CT3D reconstruction, it really helps. With that, uh, uh, I think we have reached to the end of the discussion and there are no more questions. Still, ma'am, if any, in any way I get any question, I, I'll send it across to you. Thank you for sparing your time and uh, giving this opportunity for learning from you. It was an Thank you so much, Nitin. It was indeed my pleasure to be part of this. Thank you so much. If there is any question, uh, sure, ma'am. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.